Korea, 1915. Under American leadership, the United Nations went to war for the first time. What began as a conflict between rival regimes, North and South, turned into a confrontation between East and West, threatening to escalate into a Third World War. The Allied forces became embroiled in a war unlike any they'd known. Yet for the Americans, it served as a military rehearsal for one they would come to know only too well in Vietnam. This was a war of sharp contrasts, like the harsh Korean terrain itself, ranging from freezing mountains in winter to parched valleys in summer. It started in rapid advances and retreats, and it ended in trench warfare and continuous bombardment, reminiscent of the First World War. The UN forces relied on superior weaponry to limit their losses, pounding the lightly armed communist soldiers who sacrificed thousands attacking in human waves. Experts believed that the sheer volume of UN air power would win the war. The latest jets added their weight to the range of Second World War planes, using rockets, bombs and napalm in support of their ground forces. Yet even the massive American bombing campaign that systematically pulverized northern cities was instrumental only in grinding the war to its final bitter stalemate, devastating the country in the process. It was a war which nobody won, but the losers could be seen everywhere. A sea of refugees constantly set adrift by the changing tide of battle. Three million Korean civilians are estimated to have died in three years of war. Korea was no stranger to war. Common borders with China, Russia, and proximity to Japan had made it the focus of three wars in 60 years, ending in its forcible colonization by Japan in 1910. Yet it was the Allied decision of 1945 splitting the country along the 38th parallel, with Russia and America each occupying half, that led to the Korean War, and has left it today with rival governments in Pyongyang and Seoul, holding sway over two very different Korean societies. The Soviet Union declared war on the Japanese armies occupying Manchuria and Korea in August that year. In a swift campaign, they crushed Japanese dreams of an alternative empire. The surrender of their colonial masters brought fresh hope of independence for Koreans and they greeted the Russians as liberators as they marched south, opening the whole country to them. The Russians halted at an arbitrary line on the map in response to a last-minute American proposal, even though the first Americans didn't arrive in Korea until the end of September. Initial encounters between the two armies at the 38th parallel were friendly, but the chill of the Cold War soon reached Korea. When a UN commission was set up to oversee reunification in 1948, the Russians refused to acknowledge its power in the north. Elections went ahead in the south alone, resulting in a government recognized by the United Nations. Its president was Syngman Rhee, a Korean nationalist who deposed the Japanese occupation and spent years in exile in the United States. He declared the new Republic of Korea from Seoul. In Pyongyang, the Russians backed Kim Il-sung, a communist guerrilla leader who'd made his name fighting the Japanese. He proclaimed the Democratic People's Republic of Korea the same year. Both governments enlisted armies to support their claim to the whole country. When the Russians withdrew in 1948, they left Kim Il-sung with a well-trained force. American advisers stayed on to train the Southern Army when their own troops pulled out the following year. Sporadic fighting between the two regimes turned into pitched battle on the 25th of June, 1950. Both sides claimed the other attacked first, but within hours the Northern forces, spearheaded by their 230 Russian tanks, had broken through into Southern territory.
The United Nations Security Council identified the North as the aggressor. The absence of the Russian delegate boycotting in support of communist China's claim to a seat left the Americans a clear field. And a second meeting called for military support for the South. Leadership of the UN forces was given to the commander of the American Army of Occupation in Japan, a man who had already become a legend. General Douglas MacArthur was a graduate of West Point, decorated in France in 1917. His brilliant island hopping campaign in the Pacific in World War II was rewarded by effective governorship of Japan. His appointment as leader of the first UN army in the field seemed vindicated by his decision to land at Incheon. But when he argued for a campaign against the Chinese mainland, President Truman relieved him of command. The United Nations forces included 95,000 South Koreans at the start of the war, who were joined by 300,000 American troops. Although 15 other countries sent military forces, their combined contribution of around 44,000 was dwarfed by the massive American military presence. Opposing them were 135,000 North Korean soldiers. When China entered the war in October 1950, it added 250,000 men to that total a figure that grew markedly as the war progressed. By the 28th of June, the North T-34 tanks had led them into Seoul itself, having swept through the Yijongbu Valley with ease. The southern forces had melted before them, and now their ranks were swollen by local guerrillas. In their haste, the southern army had blown the bridge across the Han River too soon trapping some of their own forces, as well as thousands of refugees. The result was a massacre. After a week, the North Koreans renewed their drive south. The US 7th Fleet went into action. Flying round the clock, its planes tried to slow the advance. The few northern planes were swept from the skies in the first weeks, giving the UN planes a free reign from then on. On MacArthur's own initiative, the B-29 superfortresses stationed in Japan carried out the first raids on targets north of the 38th parallel. Yet what slowed the northern advance most was the constant stream of refugees choking the road south. Into this chaos came the first US troops, 400 infantrymen known as Task Force Smith. Their orders were to join South Korean soldiers awaiting the northern advance. They took position on the 4th of July. Next morning, a column of T-34 tanks backed by infantry drove at them. With no sign of the promised South Korean support, they attempted to halt the northern columns alone. It was a disaster. The tanks went straight through. Their outdated bazookas simply bounced off the armor, and their artillery had the wrong ammunition. For many, the fighting was over, but the suffering had just begun. Their fate was soon shared by other Americans, thrust too hastily into the line. In the following weeks, the South Korean and US forces suffered a string of defeats, falling back to the southeast around the main supply port of Pusan. In danger of being driven out of Korea altogether, the UN command built a defensive line along the Naktong River. General Walton Walker deployed the US 8th Army along its eastern bank. With the bridges blown, this offered some protection along part of the 130-mile perimeter he'd drawn around Busan. Troops and equipment from all over the world poured into the port. Though it didn't seem like it, the UN forces actually outnumbered the North Koreans by the middle of August. For six weeks, the UN conducted a stubborn defense of the perimeter. Fighting from prepared positions with artillery support and air cover, they acquitted themselves better than they had in the opening weeks. But the North Koreans showed no signs of flagging. What? 
They launched repeated attacks across fordable sections of the Nakton, and General Walker kept some of his best troops in reserve to meet any potential breakthrough. When a North Korean attack succeeded in penetrating the perimeter early in August, he called on the 1st Marine Provisional Brigade to counterattack. On arrival in Korea, these elite troops had learned of the string of early defeats. Stories of open panic and desertion only added to America's humiliation. But the Marines had their own way of doing things and fought by their own codes. Virtually self-contained with their own armor, artillery and air corps, they were a highly disciplined and effective fighting force. Many who fought with them in Korea were critical of their habit of attacking head-on, no matter what opposition they faced, regarding it as brave but reckless. And it was reflected in the high proportion of casualties they suffered. As one witness commented, they went up in columns of companies and they came back in platoons of stretchers. Yet even here, they continued their tradition of bringing their dead or wounded back from the battlefield, no matter what the cost of retrieving them. And they got results. In two days of counterattack, they'd driven the North Koreans back across the Nak Tong. The UN held the perimeter once again. In early September, the Marine contingents were pulled back to the docks in Pusan. As they cleaned the grime of battle from their weapons, rumors flew that their next mission would be of the kind their corps was created for, a seaborne landing. On the 7th of September, they filed on board ship to join an armada already en route from Japan, carrying 10 corps to Incheon. It was to be General MacArthur's masterstroke, a landing 150 miles behind the front line at the port for Seoul, seizing the capital itself at the heart of the enemy supply line. The chiefs of staff protested that a landing at Incheon was fraught with problems. The approach through a narrow channel was governed by Walmido Island. The port itself had high walls and a 30-foot tidal range that at low tide could leave landing craft stranded on mudflats. MacArthur argued that the obvious difficulties would only add to the surprise. Dismissing all objections, he concluded simply, we shall land at Incheon and I shall crush them. After five days of sustained bombardment, the 260-strong fleet took position off Incheon on the 15th of September. MacArthur had ordered the Marines to lead the first wave, and as they clambered onto the landing craft at dawn, he appeared on the bridge of the flagship to watch them head in for the first objective, Wolmido Island. 